Hey, Connor, how are you? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Doing great. So uh, I start all these interviews by saying I'm literally in this documentary because I used to come to the George Lucas talk show every <laughs> single time. But one of my favorite parts of this is your mom uh, mm -hmm. saying what I used to love the most about this show, which is going because I was interning. I would go and talk to my friends at the box office. And there was always at least one person who was so angry that it wasn't actual George Lucas at the East Village. I and when, know. When she brought it up, I was so happy. I was like, someone remembered that that is kind of what we were contending with every time we went to the George Lucas talk show. But yeah, I always love that because I felt like particularly then, particularly when it was a midnight $5 yeah. show, I felt like there were so many things built in that there was no level of guilt that we ruined anyone's evening because it would just be like, you should have known this is too good to be true. <laughs> you know, that $5 that at midnight in a $5 bar. midnight, small venue, and there are still tickets left. Whereas if you had, you know, if you announced that George Lucas was going to be at the Beacon Theater two weeks from now, the tickets would sell out in a, five minutes, you know? Yeah, and they all, we were always like, Look at the venue you're standing in. It's next to a two boots. Why do you think that he's here in the two boots? Technically lobby. It's the back of the two boots is where the box office. I, I, I remember at least one show where like there were people who came in that we we knew the people in the audience were the people who had shown up for that. And I just remember thinking like if they enjoy the the show, you know, it might, you know, on most most of our shows, I feel like if the person likes comedy at all, we would give them a good show, even if they came there thinking they were going to hear George Lucas talking seriously for an hour, you know? Yeah. When, what I really liked about this, and I, I got so irrationally angry in a commenter after Slam Dance, which was just simply like, they said, oh, as someone who loves George Lucas talk show now, there wasn't really anything for me. There's no community in this. And then me, someone who all of my friends were from the George Lucas talk show, that was my community and all that kind of stuff. I just got irrationally angry. I was like, this is for us. You get something online one. We don't have it anymore. But it does show like kind of, you know, the two different sides that do kind of, they do cross over, but the like communities that were formed from this show, was it important for you? I know this started before the online show had popped off, but was it important for you in retrospect, to kind of highlight that community that the show did have from the East Village to Hell's Kitchen and all of the people who just came time and time again? I mean, I don't know. I mean, the original origin of the doc, they were just going to film one of our shows professionally mm -hmm. with multiple cameras and good sound just to preserve it. So I think a lot of the things about the docs that make me happiest are purely the time capsule things. Like even just the being able to see a cutaway to the audience is an experience that you know when you're on the stage you have an awareness of the audience but it's, for me it's a very blurry thing mm -hmm. it's unless you're directly talking to an audience member um you don't necessarily fully get that same it's very different than looking at a direct camera shot of an audience member laughing because mm -hmm. I, you know, you don't spend a lot of time during the show specifically trying to clock people's reactions. So it's interesting to see that preserved. It's interesting to see, um, you know, we did, we knew even at the time that it was going to be like, let's capture a little bit of what this feels like because it's ephemeral. It's going to go away. And that was before we realized that it really was going to fully go away in the sense that like, We'll never be able to do that show probably in a Broadway theater the way we were for that last couple of years yeah. at Hell's Kitchen. Um, I think that's it's interesting because dramatically originally when it became, when it went from being they're just going to film a show mm -hmm. to then being a documentary, they, I remember they were envisioning that the Star Wars Day show would be like the emotional climax of that. I think they had an idea that like it would all build up to the Star Wars Day show. But I think they had maybe a little bit more of a dramatic sort of noises off idea of like, we'll see all the things going wrong or whatever. I'm like, nothing really goes wrong uh, because we just incorporate mistakes into the show. And so it's interesting that then with the pandemic, 
it actually gave the documentary something that felt a little bit weightier in terms of like me talking about whether we're going to keep doing the show or not having it's interesting to see a version of yourself on film thinking like maybe we will, won't do this anymore and that 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 me in like late 2019 would not have believed like well not only are you never going to be able to do this version of the show this way again uh you're going to do like 300 plus hours of the show you're going to do more of this show in the first two months of the pandemic than you did in the previous like eight years or whatever six years yeah like we because that first show was 31 hours long the first live stream we realized once we did a few more shows that we'd already lapped the monthly hour-long version because you know, the most you would get would be 12 hours a year yeah. of doing the show and so we did over two years worth of shows in the one. first live stream Jeez. Well, and you were saying preserve and I had been asking, well, specifically mainly like Anna Maria and Patrick, because all of us had been there for so long. Mm -hmm. It is so interesting watching it because it would like unlock memories. Like when you were doing, when you were singing man who sold the world to Disney, mm -hmm. I could JD in the corner. And I was like, I remember when JD did his entire rundown of labyrinth and it would just like unlock all of these moments. And they were all like, Oh, it was, it's focused on Connor, but I want to ask you specifically, was there a show that you were like, yeah, but I wish they put this in? Because it's like, I know I have shows, but do you have one that you were like, I wish we had gotten a clip on this? Not a specific show, because I, I, I do feel like, I know that Rob Malone, who edited the documentary, uh, he had spoken to me about how it's a tricky thing because of the nature of the show. It's not designed to be cut into pieces mm -hmm. so that you could do short pieces from the show and it would look intriguing but it was hard to cut long pieces from the show because what you generally have is a slow build up to uh interactions that then start to pay off and inter interweave with one another that it's hard to just pull you know a 30 second clip that's funny from the yeah. show that you you either have to watch 10 minutes of it or 10 seconds of it and I mean, I think if I, if there's anything that I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of, I, I, there's one specific thing I think that was, I would have really liked to see um, a montage of Sean Diston's Jar Jar. Just, I think this was the one of the only notes that I had pitched to them. And I think it was either too complicated or maybe they didn't have the right footage or whatever. But I was like, I'd love to see him just introducing himself, Misa Jar Jar Binks. Mm -hmm. from the first couple of shows through like the 10th or 11th you know like because he gradually went from doing a full impression to just having his own voice and i thought that would be a really funny thing just to see the progression of him uh um because that was sort of the original plan like he, he started doing a character that he would gradually sort of drop as as if jar jar was becoming um less of a cartoon and more of a a, a different character in, in our world yeah, because I, I said, I was like, man, I wish, like, the people will never know about Sir Alec Guinness, <laughs> like, J.J. Abrams, and I was like, there were so many. Yeah, know, like, I've never even seen, I've never even seen the J.J. Abrams episode, because that that only happened when Casey Jost was J.J. and Brandon Scott Jones was, I think he was who Spielberg? was he? Wasn't it Spielberg and J.J. Abrams? Well, I know that we had a Tamanic play Spielberg at one point. Yeah. But I think for for BSG it might have been someone else. I can't remember. Um, I remember that night because we talked about Indiana Jones at length, like after the show, but I can't remember who it literally there. happened. I think um I think Griffin and I were both filming uh Search Party. It was either Search Party or Orange is the New Black. There was something where I just couldn't get back in time. Yeah. And yeah, I mean the thing about it is like i know that I, ha I have we have a lot of those early shows patrick would you know would film all of them really just in case more than anything it was it was we put a, a, the first few online and i quickly started feeling like it was easier to get people to do the show if there isn't the pressure of it's going to be online mm -hmm. you know 
we put clips or photos or things like that. But there is something about uh, as much as I like having it archived, having the 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 glimpse of it. There is something about the ephemeral nature of all this stuff that rather than having everything preserved, some things are better as a you had to be there sort of feeling, you know, because, you know, sometimes you look back at an old video and, you, and it's better than you remember and it's really fun to see it. And sometimes you look back and it kind of takes the shine off it a little. It's you remember it as being a, a pure triumph and you see it and you're like, oh, it's just fine, you know? <laughs> Yeah, because it makes me, I always explain the reaction to John Hamm actually being there. And I'm like, I am sure if I watched it, it was not as dramatic as I remember everyone being like, ha ha ha, John Hamm. And then John Hamm walks on, we all just lost it. That one, I I do think, I, I wonder if, I can't remember if I have that one on tape or if Patrick has it somewhere, but that one I do think probably does live up to it because there was no reason for John Hamm to be there. He was, it was a Felicity episode. He was not ever on Felicity. For Janine Garofalo and uh, Scott Adsit and him. And so we all were there like, Janine Garofalo, that's cool. I hadn't had contact with John since the early 90s, literally since I was in high school. And, oh, I'm going to see if I can find the email from John because it really, I, uh, there are a few things that it, have impressed me more in my life than uh, just in generally how good John Hamm is at email. Um, <laughs> like literally, if I were to email JD Amato right now and John Hamm and try to race to see who'd email me back, I would bet everything I own. I, I would bet on lives of people I care about that I would hear back from John Hamm before I'd hear back. So here's, this was... November 5th, 2015. Yeah, I was like, it was a long time ago. It was a Thursday night, uh, 7.20 p.m., the night before the, the Felicity show. The subject in the email, this is still our email chain, by the way, when I respond <laughs> to him, uh, like, literally, since <laughs> this is the way we communicate, is this email chain where the original subject heading is, hello from Connor Ratliff at UCB, parentheses mu dash ordinary people 1992 and i said and i literally my mom said to me that she saw that john ham was going to be was in new york for something uh -huh. some event and I, she was just observing on it and then i i i had john ham's email uh but i From never 1992? used 1992 nope nope that we didn't have email we didn't have email. Well, that's right. Email. I mean, I was, I yeah. was still there. Email, I forgot about it. The, the previous time we had communicated, neither of us would have had an email because email didn't exist. It was that's all I was doing. So here. I wrote to him, hi, John. Don't know if this will reach you or get lost in the shuffle, but in any case, greetings after two plus decades since we shared the stage at MU. Uh, oh, and then I said, I believe McBrayer passed on a hello to you from me the last time we did ASCAT together here, because I had the one first time I met McBrayer, I knew McBrayer was friends with John Hamm, and I had this interaction with him that where I'm like, this is going to feel bad for about 20 seconds, and then it'll feel good, which was <laughs> I went up to McBrayer after we'd done a show, and it was the first time meeting McBrayer. And I was like, I said, Jack, hey, can I ask you? I said, you're friends with John Hamm, right? I could see Jack, his face fell, like, what screenplay does this? guy i've just met want me to pass along you know what i mean like he was like uh, yeah and and i was like i was in a play with him when i was in high school and he was in college and i and just say hi to him for me right and he was like oh great. he like immediately brightened up like i don't want anything from him or whatever i just was so i said this i believe we're gonna pass on hello to you and i said i'm in nyc now and a regular performer at ucb uh da, da, da. i saw an item that you might be in new york this week I wanted to throw out that I'm doing a show tomorrow night with guests Scott Adson and Janine Garofalo, Midnight at UCB East. It's a monthly thing I do called the George Lucas Talk Show. Basically exactly what it sounds like. It's a real talk show where I pretend to be George Lucas and interview real guests as themselves. Tomorrow night's show is entirely devoted to the late 1990s J.J. Abrams TV show Felicity. The idea being that George just binge watched all four seasons of that show to prepare for seeing The Force Awakens. I'll be interviewing Janine and Scott because they each had guest roles on that show. If you happen to be around and feel like being a surprise drop-in guest, I think it would be really funny whether you have any connection to Felicity or not. It's almost potentially funnier if you have never seen an episode. 
Uh, anyway, just want to reach out and throw this out there in case this email got to you in time. You have me in town. I'm sure our paths will cross again at some point in the world of comedy. Hope all is well, Connor. And then I had a screenshot of the New York Times listing for the Felicity show. John writes back at midnight, 12.15 that night. So hours later, and this is probably the longest ever between me emailing him responding. He says, hey, buddy. Long time indeed. Yeah, I'll come by tonight. Where and when? See ya, sucka. Ham. That is I mean, truly iconic because that, that email I sent him is crazy. Yeah, but he's he said ham. Yes. <laughs> but I will say that show lives right for him ahead. I cannot remember her name and I feel so bad. All I remember is that she was an improviser and she was a lesbian and she stood on the wall literally giggling at anything John Hamm said as if it was the funniest thing I've ever heard. And I could not keep it together because I just watched her giggle at John Hamm on the wall and everyone lost their minds. Oh, yeah, it is. And, and he was so great. But that moment we first came out, it was one of my favorite moments at UCB because... We'd already sold the show out basically because we had Garofalo, we had AdSet, and we at that point we had a following for the show, you know, people who would come every month. And I, what I really like, I really, you know, Patrick always likes it when we have pre announced guests that um, help move tickets and get a bigger crowd. Griffin and I particularly always have the feeling when it's a bigger guest, we really love it when it's not announced because. What we like about that is the feeling that like if if it's like Rachel Zegler or someone doing the show, it's way more fun to reward our people who come to see our show and then they get this great surprise guest yeah. than it is to artificially inflate the size of the audience with people who are not coming to see our show, but are just coming to see the big star who's doing the show. Because it's sort of like you know, whether they enjoy the show or not, it's it, it just sort of feels like it, it's better to have the celebrity thing be like a bonus for our weird little show mm -hmm. than to have it be the thing that drives people to go see it. Even the expectation that like, you know, because we don't, you know, sometimes we just, you know, there are often times where it, it looks like we've had like people drop out and Patrick's always like scrambling to like book a replacement. And I'm always just like, we don't need guests. Like, we all Griffin went. and I can do a show and we'll bring audience members up or something, you know, like, well, the, there's a part of me that would love to, at some point, just do a show with no guests, because sometimes, you know, sometimes it's that a show will end and we realize that we were so sort of busy focusing on our guests that Griffin and I didn't really interact that much in the mm -hmm. show or, you know. I mean, we to him. for his one man show that also mm -hmm. lived free in my head is that the last thing I saw at UCB was Griffin's one man Watto show. Yeah. And that was supposed to be the first of two. He was going to do another because I was going to be gone for two months. So he never even got to do the second installment because the second show, I believe, was going to be completely different than that one. Yeah, because it was the t the sun will come out or the two suns will come out tomorrow or whatever it ended up being. Mm -hmm. But I do have a question for my last question for you. It's from knowing you throughout the years as George Lucas, but also like I said, I was an intern and getting to see you backstage. When you were watching this documentary, are you more excited about getting to see just like those little moments? Like Leah and I, when we were in the trailer, we lost our minds, but like getting to see the, the shows and the reactions, or were you excited to tell your story and tell your side of things? within all of that? Mm, I'm definitely more excited to see things that I hadn't seen before or that I hadn't revisited in a while or that I wouldn't have seen because it's from a different angle or something. I didn't have a pressing, you know, I, I you know, it's a, that's probably the strangest part for me is that like every time I see somebody in the past like two months that I haven't seen in a while, they will say like, Oh, congratulations. And I won't know what they're <laughs> at first. I won't know what they're talking about. And I'll be like, what do you mean? They're like on your movie? I'm like, well, it's not really my movie. I cooperated with it, but like, it's not even my version of the story. It's the, even though it's me talking, it's also like 
they're drawing their own conclusions. They have their own shape to it. If I was making like uh, a, a documentary about the George Lucas talk show, it probably would uh, be completely different than what this is. Yeah. Uh, and that's not anything. That's just because we're different. It's different people doing the telling. It changes it automatically. So for me, like, there was even when they were making it, like, uh, there was a point where it started shifting a little from being a little bit less specifically focused on the George Lucas talk show and more focused on me. And that, and there were points where, because that was the same time I was making Dead Eyes. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of like, oh, there's actually areas in which this is sort of bumping over into a territory that that uh, I already like owe to HeadGum. Like I already have a contract with a company that is like telling part of this. And there's a little bit of overlap with it, but it also is like um, the, the choices they make for like, let's tell this in this order or the conclusions they draw. It's very much their view of it which is as it should be because they had complete, they're the ones who put the work in to like make a documentary. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't, if it was me doing it, it probably would have less, uh, it would probably be more of a collage. It would probably be incoherent as a viewing experience. It could probably be more uh, a collage of all the footage of the shows and some additional like backstage stuff. Like I'm really glad they have documented the part of me like having to clean up after the show because that's always a part that like nobody ever saw it. even literally Patrick and Griffin that would never see that because just because of they would leave and I would do stepfathers and then stepfathers would leave and the law firm would be on stage while I'm quietly putting away all that stuff and sometimes if it took too long I think you see footage of the law firm even like walking around like that's them there were times where they finished their show and I was still cleaning yeah. up and that part's not fun or glamorous or funny. That's all just very, um, it's just what it is, you know? Yeah. When it's, um, yeah, yeah. Go on. I was just gonna say, I was like, I loved getting to see all that stuff. Cause it's like, we all knew like, oh, well, Connor has to run, but then Patrick would come out and talk to everyone. So it was really cool to kind of see the amount of work that went into this show and making it. I will say I, at one point I for sure thought it was your funeral in there and I got so excited but then it wasn't from your funeral and I was like damn I just what was what was the thing you thought was at the funeral I think it was just you I think doing an ass cap but the way you were standing made it look because it was in Chelsea so it made it look like right. it was a funeral and I was like the funeral made the cut and then it was yeah like a regular show yeah it's one of those things where when they chose to make it like a documentary about me and the George Lucas talk show that's a very different thing because the if I was going I wouldn't make a doc like Dead Eyes is my version of like mm -hmm. telling those stories and those are all very much the design of that is my stories are are there to sort of point to other stories they're yeah. like a device that I can use to like tell something that I did, but it's also an excuse to be like, also, here's this guest and they're doing this. So it's, it's always meant to sort of open to a wider frame of things. Whereas if you were, like if they had said at one point, we want to make it a fuller documentary that encapsulates, you know, like the Gethard Show and UCB and the Terry Withers Mysteries and all these other projects, I probably would have just said no, because I kept sort of pushing back the more they tried to make it about me, because mm -hmm. I sort of feel like no matter what, those stories always tend to, the more they try to tell of my story, the more there's sort of going to be a differing opinion of like, well, wait, what is that? You know, like, I, I think there are things that they unearth that are interesting, but I also, it's just a, it's just a fragment of the story, you know? Yeah. And even in the a feature like documentary, there's things where I'm like, oh, well, that doesn't really convey this or that. Just because even in the telling of the George Lucas talk show story, like there's an aspect of when I was trying to develop it of how when we did our first couple of shows at the Producers Club, we, I lost so much money doing those that when I got to start doing it at UCB, even though UCB at that time didn't pay performers, the savings that it was to be able to do a show where they had paid for the insurance 
mm-hmm. where the venue covered that, where you didn't have to worry about um, any of the practical things because UCB took care of it. You didn't have to promote it as heavily because UCB had a built-in calendar and audience. There were so many things that now when we do shows, uh, you know, it's different now because we have a little bit of more of a profile as a show and we go places, but mm-hmm. you do have to push a little harder when you don't have a regular time in a regular venue. And that when we, we did like a show, we did like two shows at the Producers Club, one at UCB, and then we did one at like the Pit uh, Loft yeah and and we did and that one went very very poorly there was like a huge technical problem and it wasn't very well attended and there were all these like issues and it was such a relief to have a home theater like that but that's even something that you don't really even have room to explain to a casual viewer Mm -hmm. the way shows worked back then you know yeah um as i leave i do have to tell you the, the world is very small because I went to Broadway Flea this year and Rachel Zegler was there and I was with my other friend Rachel so we went as like a bit to everyone's like trying to talk to her and take pictures and all this stuff and we we're like our bit is just that we're all Rachel like we're, it's, we don't want any time we want yeah to, so it's Rachel 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 but as I left I went the world is really small though I know Patrick Cotner and like Connor and all the George Lucas talk show people and she went yeah man that is a small world <laughs> so we were at Broadway Flea and I was like I know all these people who are now your friends because uh, of the show. Yeah, I mean, that's also one of those things that, like, uh, Rachel's relationship to the show has been so fun because it's it's weird that anyone who, uh, that that's, it's such an unlikely thing that you would find a fun and, uh, like, hassle-free uh corner of the world that would be in any way star wars connected where someone could just go in and be like no one's gonna bother you here people are gonna be really nice be really happy when you show up it's like it's it's so unlikely to imagine like if you were just say to someone hey a lot of the internet's gonna be really mean but there's this one place where people are gonna be nice to you and uh and and for that to also be star wars connected at this point in time Mm -hmm that's one thing that I'm really proud of, you know, that it's, that that's been the way that it's gone. Yeah. I love it so much, but thank you for talking with me. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm going to see it again in April. So I can't wait to see see it. Nice talking with you. You have a good one. Bye.